And tonight we're going to talk about how we can stay out of the ditch. That's really what it's about. Um, we've all seen relationships go south, haven't we? Marriages, friendships, if they're not cultivated, we can lose it completely. How can we have a relationship with God that is immune to uh, defeat and defection? And we are the problem there. The church that Christ started lost its grip on the gospel and became anti-Christ. I'm not using that as a name, but as a function. Claiming the prerogatives of, and positions of Christ, speaking great words against the Most High, interposing itself between the people and God, claiming to be in control of people's salvation, um, adding human rituals and sacraments as necessary steps to salvation in place of the finished work of Jesus, isolating people from the word of God and corrupting Bible truth with pagan ideas and perversions, using physical violence against all who refuse to accept its claimed spiritual authority and teaching, and all that contrary to the character of Jesus and corrupting the message of the gospel. If the church can lose its way that bad, well, that's simply people collectively losing their way. So we could certainly do it ourselves. How can we stay out of the ditch of apostasy? How can we have a... I remember there's a, there's a rabbi named Shmuley Bateach who wrote some great books. One of his books was um, The Jewish Guide to Adultery. Now that's a rather catchy title. But his point was how to have a steaming affair with your wife the rest of your life. How to keep the marriage hot. Well, that's what we want to have with Jesus. He uses the marriage illustration. He's the groom, we're the bride. How can we have an intimate, strong relationship that never goes cold? And we all know who have sought to walk with Jesus that it's so quick and easy to kind of lose that fervor and settle back into uh, sort of being roommates with God instead of lovers. So tonight we want to talk about that. How can we abide with him in such a way that we have a strong, intimate, close relationship that stays and grows? And with that, let's pray once more. Jesus, we need you tonight. We want to know you more every day. We want to grow stronger every day, and we want you to have more access to our lives every day so you can make us more like you every day, we pray. Let this happen, and let us learn how tonight we pray in your name. Amen. All right, the Bible says that we are saved by grace through faith. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God not of works, lest anyone should boast. Remember, we liken grace to a bus. You don't own the bus. You didn't build the bus. You don't drive the bus. You don't fuel the bus. You don't maintain the bus. You don't even decide where the bus is going to go. And the bus will go where the bus is going to go, whether you get on board or not. But if you get on board, you can't help but end up where the bus is going. God is completely the one who built and functions grace. We can't add to it, we can't take away from it, but we can get on board or we can choose to not get on board. There is a seat for everyone on the bus. God has made salvation available to everyone, but he won't force you to get on board. But there's a seat for everyone. And last, uh, two nights ago, we talked about how to get on the bus and what the bus does. Now tonight, we want to talk not so much about grace, but about Faith, but let's do a little review first. Remember this slide that we built slowly last time. God has a gift for you. It's called grace or eternal life. It comes through trusting in Jesus, the Son of God, and you can know you're saved. You can know you're in a relationship with Jesus. But there is a problem. All have sinned. And what is sin? Sin is essentially telling God to go away and leave me alone. I'll do it myself. Thank you. The problem is if God really goes away, life goes away because he is life. We are not. We don't have life in ourselves. Our life is derived from him. And if we run off with another lover who can't give us life, life will not happen. Now, we don't die immediately. We're like the Energizer Bunny. We keep going and going and going, but eventually the battery wears down. The Bible says it took Adam 930 years for his battery to go down. It takes us a little bit less than that now. A lot of mutation in the wrong direction has happened in the last 
6,000 years or so of biblical history. We've all sinned. We're all trying to go independent from God. It's in our nature. And sin is lawlessness. We noted that um, law by nature demands perfect obedience or a penalty, right? Stop signs all the way every time and 99% of the time isn't enough. And if you say, I'm sorry, that doesn't get you off the hook. If you keep the law of gravity, except one day you decide to break it, you discover that uh, the, the law has no mercy uh, and you can yell, I'm sorry, all the way down and you'll hit just as hard. And we noted that it's the same way with God's laws, but God's laws are not made up to test us on whether we're gonna obey or not. God's laws simply describe how life works, how life works. So if we step outside of how life works, that's called sin, we step into where life doesn't work, and what is that? Well, that's death. And so we noted that the wage of sin is death because not that it's an imposed penalty like a fine for running a stop sign, but it's an intrinsic result like the law of gravity. If you separate from life, you know, if you're diving and you've got your, your tanks and your regulator and everything's connected up and you go down 100 feet and then you cut the, the, the tube from your regulator to the tanks, you're gonna die. Not because somebody imposed death on you, it's a natural result, you can't breathe underwater. In the same way, sin's intrinsic result, not God's punishment for sinners. Sin is killing you, God's not killing sinners. God doesn't say, serve me or die. He says, you're dying, serve me and live. We're born on the Titanic after it hit the iceberg. Our only hope is to get off into a lifeboat and there's a seat in the lifeboat for everyone. But the intrinsic result is if you don't get off the boat, the, the big boat that's sinking, it doesn't matter whether you're good or bad in your behavior on the big boat, you'll be just as dead when it goes down. So the intrinsic result of sin is that the ship is sinking. We're on a sinking ship. The bad news of the Bible is we're all doomed. The good news of the Bible is God built a bus called grace that can take us back from death into life. And we liken that to this diagram. Jesus lived a perfect life. What is required in order to live? Perfect obedience to the laws of life. Then he died the intrinsic penalty of all sin. You might say because he died, we don't have to die, but because he lived, we get to live. So the Bible says, let me back up once more on that. So when we're covered with grace, Jesus' life and his death, there's no way in the universe we can be lost. The past no longer condemns us, he died and we're forgiven. The future can't condemn us. He already lived a perfect life. And we're not condemned to repeat the future because he lives now and we can grow by his power to become more and more like him, which is simply entering more and more into real life. You realize anything other than living the life of Christ is simply a few thrills on the way to death. That's all it is. So obedience is not about being good. It's about living. Anything less is not really life. All right? So that's our review. When I'm covered with all that Jesus is, when I have Jesus, and remember, it's not like he gives me a credit card to swipe every time I sin and have a debt to pay. He doesn't give me forgiveness. He doesn't give me eternal life. He gives me himself. And when I have him, I have everything. He has perfect payment and perfect life. I've got a big debt. When we get married, his payment pays my debt and left on our joint account is eternal life. And as long as I'm in Jesus, I can't lose. Amen? All right. So then where do I fit into this picture? I have nothing to do about grace. It's all built by God, run by God, driven by God. It's all God. Where I fit in is under faith, because faith is a relationship word. There's no such thing, I think I mentioned this the other night, there's no such thing of a, as a person of faith. It's, are you a person of faith in what? Do I have faith in Jesus? Do I have faith in the tooth fairy? Do I have faith in Buddha? What do I have faith in? 
What am I putting my trust in? I'm a person of trust. That means nothing until we define what I'm trusting in. We're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Trusting the grace that he has made for us. Faith is where we get involved. Faith is how we receive the wonderful gift of grace. Faith is how we get on the bus that goes from death to life. Faith is how we experience transformation, obedience, victory over sin. Faith is at the core of it all. Justification, salvation is by faith alone, as is living the Christian life or sanctification or holiness or obedience. That too is by faith alone. The only thing I have to do is in the realm of faith. So tonight, let's talk about faith. For by grace you have been saved through faith. What is faith? Can you give me two synonyms for the word faith? I'll, I'll, t I'll take responses here. Trust, okay, that's the second one. What's the other one? Belief, that's the first one, okay? Belief and trust. Now, these are synonyms, but I'm gonna use the words belief and trust to kind of nuance the meaning of faith, okay? I want to define belief as intellectual. And I want to define trust as commitment. And let me illustrate that with this chair. So let's say that I came over to your house and you said, Pastor Gary, have a seat. This is your living room, okay? That's your piano and this is your living room here. And I'm, you, you offer me this chair. Now, I've never been to your house before, so have I ever sat in this chair? No. You tell me to sit down. Have you ever sat down on a chair that didn't hold you up? I have. It can be very embarrassing and it can cause injury. I mean, how many of you, be honest now, in first grade or kindergarten, thought it was really cool to pull the chair out when some kid sat down? And you got the royal treatment from the teacher because you could cause lifelong back injury by doing that funny little thing that we thought was so great. So I'm not gonna sit down in this chair until I believe it's gonna hold me up. You tell me to have a seat in a chair I've never sat in. How can I gain evidence to determine whether or not this chair will hold me up when I sit down? I'd like to suggest there's at least three ways. One is I can observe the chair. It seems to have all the right parts and they seem to be connected, okay? Number two, I can test the chair without becoming vulnerable to it. And sure enough, it seems to be solid. Now, remember this is your living room, right? This is your chair. So have you sat in this chair? And if it's your chair in your living room, you're gonna say, well, I have, yes. And I can ask you, did it hold you up when you sat in it? And you're gonna say yes. Now I've got three pieces of evidence. I've got observation, I've got empirical testing, and I've got a witness that says this chair will hold me up. All right, let's say I have moved from being a non-believer in this chair to being a believer in this chair. I now believe this chair will hold me up. Is it doing me any good yet? No, why not? I believe, isn't belief enough? Like I said, you can believe in the bus. I believe in the bus and there goes the bus I believe in and you're still standing on the curb. So trusting this chair needs to have an intellectual component, I'm calling that belief, based on evidence, empirical testing, observation, and a witness. But if I'm going to receive any benefits from the chair, I have to move a step further and I have to move into the area of trust or commitment. When you sit in a chair, have you thought about it? You're making a commitment, aren't you? Now, how much do I have to trust this chair in order to receive the benefits? There's no such thing as half trust. If I maintain a position where I could save myself if this chair gave way, my knees are already killing me, right? The only way to receive rust, trust, I'm sorry, the only way to receive rest is to trust the chair all the way. And if I'm truly completely trusting this chair and it gives way, I'm on the floor. There's nothing I can do about it. So the point I'm trying to make with that is this. 
Faith involves two ingredients. It involves intellectual belief based on evidence. It's not a shot in the dark. Now, face it, no matter how much I test that chair, I can't prove it's going to hold me up before I sit down, but I can have plenty of evidence upon which to base that commitment. Secondly, I have to sit down if I'm going to receive the rest. If I'm going to receive the benefits, I have to sit down. It's not enough to just believe, I have to trust. I can't just believe what grace is, I've got to get on the bus. I've got to sit down in the chair. So, let's go now to the idea of trusting Christ. How, how well, well, the belief thing was the diagram, right? That whole night, two nights ago, I went through evidence, what the Bible says, what Jesus has done to help you understand what grace is. But now how do you place your commitment into that grace? I believe that the trusting God involves a threefold commitment. The first is you have to trust him with your past. That's from the time you accept him back. He says, I give you the forgiveness of sins. If you confess, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Amen? Forgiven and washed clean. Now, you just have to accept that, kind of intellectually, that Jesus said he did it. The evidence is there that he came, he lived, he died, he rose, and you have to say, okay, I choose to accept that. It's almost an intellectual exercise, but the more you truly trust it, the guilt will be gone, and you'll be able to live free from those old sins. Secondly, you have to trust God with your eternity from the end of your life on. That's where the Bible says Jesus is your savior. You can't do anything about your past, it's in the bank, amen? You can't do undo any of it. You can't do anything about your eternity. It's completely out of your hands. But Jesus says, if you trust me, I give you eternal life. Okay, I'm going to trust you. Thank you. I believe that when I die, I'll come up in the right resurrection. Or if you came right now, you would welcome me in because I am in a relationship with Jesus. Bible says this is the testimony. Here are the first-hand facts that God has already given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who is in the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. I've written these things to you who are trusting, believing in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Okay, Jesus, thank you. I accept the fact that you've promised me eternity. There is this verse also. If when we were enemies in the past, sinners, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, he died, the intrinsic consequences of all sin, much more, even better, once I've been reconciled, I shall be saved by his life. His life, perfect life, guarantees I'm going to make it. And so I trust that he's my savior. The third aspect of trusting God involves the present. Now, this is the one that gets sticky. You know, we like God to forgive all our sins and we like him to promise us heaven, but do I really have to put him in charge now? Don't I get to kind of ever get to do what I want to do? The present is where Jesus is our Lord. Now, what is a Lord? It's not just a religious word. It's a secular word. The Lord lived in the castle and everybody did what he said you could go to work tomorrow and your boss could say I need you to do such and such and you could answer yes Lord they would probably think you were being insubordinate and mocking but you'd be using a perfectly good English word to to say yes boss the Lord is the guy in charge he's the boss and lordship is all or nothing you see, we kind of like the idea of giving God our past. Forgiveness, guilt is gone. We like giving him our eternity. I get to go to heaven and live forever, a better place. But giving him the present is where you might say the rubber of faith meets the road of reality. Let me illustrate lordship with the chair. So this is now the chair of faith. 
If I'm trusting, am I covered with grace? Yes, we've learned that. We're saved by grace through faith. So when I'm sitting in the chair, there is a canopy over this chair. You have to visualize this. It's not an umbrella I hold in my hand that I can walk around with. It's connected to the chair. The only way to be covered is to be trusting. Are you with me? Okay. Now let's put wheels on this chair. Life moves on. It's not static. And let's put the Lord behind the chair. He's Lord of the chair and me when I'm in it. All right. So one day he says, Gary, let's go over this way, slightly to the right. And I say, okay, Lord, I'm trusting. I'm covered. You're in charge. Let's go. The next day he says, let's go over this way, slightly to the left. And I say, okay, I'm trusting. I'm covered. You're in charge. Let's go. Then one day he says, we're just going to wait here today. Let's stop. Now, I don't like where we are. I don't want to wait here, but I want to be covered. So what is my choice? I guess I stay in the chair. Stay covered. He's in charge. Now, one day he says, Gary, let's go over here hard to the right. That's kind of symbolic. And I look over there hard to the right and I say, Lord, that is not my idea of a good time. That's not the plan I have for my life. That's not what I want to do with my life. In fact, Lord, let me inform you of something. You see over there hard to the left, that's what I want to do. That's where I want to go. Those are my goals. What are my options? Is my option to go that way or that way? Or is my option to stay in the chair or get out? You see, if I stay in the chair, I'm going his way. The only way I can go the other way is to get out of the chair because the chair is going over there. Does that make sense? Now this illustration is to make just one point and I'll tell you later on the point it's not supposed to make but it's to make one point what is my focus as a Christian once I commit my life to Jesus what is my focus from then on is it to try from then on to hard to be good and not be bad or is it to try hard from then on to trust and keep trusting you get the point the focus of your life once you give your life to Jesus is not to behave, it's to trust. Now, if I'm trusting, will I end up behaving? I can't help it. So the focus of the Christian life on letting Jesus be Lord of the present is an all or nothing trust. What do I work on? I work on trust. I don't work on behavior. It's not about from now on trying hard to be good and not be bad. It's about trying hard to trust. And we like this idea of God giving us forgiveness for all of our past sins. And we like this idea of having eternal life. But we don't really like the idea of not being in charge today. I want to do what I want to do. Isn't that right? We are in charge people. But now, I want you to notice there are three aspects to this trust, giving him our past, our eternity, and our present. Is there any value in only giving him two of those three things? I want to give him my past. I want to give him my eternity, but I'd like to stay in charge in the present. You know what that's like trying to do? Sit two-thirds of the way down in a chair and call it rest. It doesn't work. It is all or nothing. Either Jesus is forgiver, savior, and Lord, or he's none of the above. You can't slice Jesus up and have two-thirds of Jesus and a third of you. It's all or nothing. So the focus of the Christian life, once you commit your life to Jesus, is not about trying hard to be good and not be bad. It's about trying hard to trust. I don't have this verse to put on the screen right now. But Jesus was asked by the people, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? What does God want us to work on? And he said, I want you to work on trusting me. God says work on trust. The illustration says work on trust. We'll see that in the Bible in a few minutes. The focus of the Christian life 
is not on behavior, it's on trusting. We work on trust. How do you work on trust? By the way, that trust will transform your behavior. Behavior is important. The problem is you don't have the capability to fix your behavior, but God has given you the ability to seek him in trust, and we'll see how to do that. Here's a phrase that I heard many, many, many years ago that I had to think about. You cannot trust someone you do not know. How do you try hard to get to trust someone? The only thing you can do is to try hard to get to know them. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you pick up hitchhikers? Especially ladies. Do you, you know, some guys by the road and you just stop and pick them up? You actually do. You're not the wisest person on earth, according to what everyone's going to think here. Why don't most of us not, pitch, not pick up hitchhikers? Because we've heard the stories, right? One time back when I was uh, in college, um, I was up visiting my sister in Bozeman, Montana, and I wanted to go into a place in the north end of Yellowstone Park called Roaring Springs. It's a really cool spot where a really hot river of water, I mean a whole river that's too hot to get in, flows into a cold river, and you can kind of pick your warmth in this natural jacuzzi. There are even some little caves you can dip into that are like steam caves. It's a really cool place, and I wanted to go there. I didn't have a car. This is the 1970s, so I stuck out my thumb. Had no problem getting a ride from Bozeman to Livingston. Some rancher picked me up, took me halfway between Livingston and the park entrance, and left me there. And I think I sat there for two hours. I was kind of a hippie for a day. I had a ukulele, and I was just kind of being a hippie for a day. I sat there, very little traffic, nobody would stop, cars just going by every once in a while. Finally, one lady with two or three small children in a blue Chevy station wagon drove by and they all looked as she went by. A Few minutes later, she drove by the other way and they all looked again. A Couple minutes later, she drove by again and stopped. Reached over, rolled down the passenger side window and said young man nobody's ever going to pick you up here and I said really and then she did something foolish that I'm glad she did so I agree with you now the pickup hitchhiker she said get in you look honest so I got in and I said as we started to drive why don't people pick up hitchhikers here and she said well a couple years ago there was a young man in a little sports car driving down through here and he picked up a hippie and the hippie made him drive down by the river, and the hippie killed him and ate him. And they found the man's fingers in the hippie's pocket. I said, I think I understand why people here don't pick up hitchhikers, right? We've heard the stories. By the way, just for the fun of it, I gotta tell you the rest of the story. Some 30 years later, I was uh, driving through Yellowstone, I think the first time since then that I was driving through alone. And I stopped in Livingston and went to the library and I said to the, there's a retired gentleman as a volunteer there, I said, this is a story that happened to me, I was told, can you verify that it's true? He said, absolutely. Went to the computer, printed out a whole form, sure enough, absolutely true. I might have had a couple minor details wrong on the chronology, uh, but and the, and the hippie went to prison, and what I also learned from the story is he'd just gotten out. <laughs> and nobody knew where he was. Uh-oh, we're in trouble. Anyway, why don't you pick up hitchhikers? Because we've all heard the stories. Now, if I were out hitchhiking, Gary Venden, pastor of the Glendale Church, the guy who's preaching at the seminar, you're driving tomorrow, and there I am with my thumb out. Would you be more likely to pick me up than just any old person? Why? You've gotten to know me a little bit. You can't trust somebody you don't know. But if you get to know somebody, one of two things will happen. You'll either come to trust them because they're trustworthy, or you'll truly come to distrust them because you discover they're not trustworthy. We've met both kinds, right? See, the reality is 
the chair illustration and Jesus himself tell us to work on trust, but you can't work on trust directly. You can only work on trust indirectly, right? If you work on getting to know somebody and they're trustworthy, the more you get to know them, what's going to happen? Automatically, the more you'll trust them. And if you get to know somebody who's not, trust, who's not trustworthy, the more you get to know them automatically, the less you'll trust them. And it's actually impossible for you to distrust a trustworthy person that you've gotten to know. And it's impossible to make yourself trust an untrustworthy, untrustworthy person you've gotten to know. Trust is the automatic, intrinsic, inevitable byproduct of knowing. So if you want to trust someone, you have to get to know them. Notice John 17, verse 3. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Now, if I were to tell you about how to get eternal life, you'd expect me to probably talk about sin and repentance and confession and the cross and grace and all these other things. And all of a sudden, Jesus simply says, eternal life is to know me and the Father, period. How does that work? Well, if I know him, will I trust him? I can't help it because he's trustworthy. If I trust him, am I covered with grace? I can't help it. If I'm covered with grace, am I saved? I can't help it. Do you follow that? So the entire focus of the Christian life after you receive Jesus isn't on trying to change your behavior. It's on seeking to know Jesus better day by day. And that will keep you covered and change your behavior. Does that make sense? This is cause and effect stuff. How do you get to know someone? I'd like to say the one ingredient above all others is to take time with them. There's no substitute for time. Time is time. You know, if, if, if you guys, you single guys, you, you meet a young lady that kind of causes that little spark to happen and you decide you'd like to get acquainted with her, you're probably going to ask her out to dinner. Not because you're hungry, but because you want to spend time together, right? A dinner is a nice way to be face-to-face -face and get acquainted instead of just sitting across a little table staring at each other, right? It's, it's a good way to do it. Go do something together that you can talk and spend time. Time is time. And how many marriages where people were madly in love a few years later have completely fallen apart because they stopped spending time together? The kids and the job got all the time, and they didn't have any time for each other anymore, and pretty soon it's like, who are you? I mean, how many marriages break up about the time the kids leave the house? because the parents spent the last 20 years on the kids and not on each other. Time is time. You have to spend time. Now, the other ingredient of getting to know someone is communication. If you ask somebody out and all you do is go to a place where the music is so loud you can't talk, or you're just watching TV and movies, you're not going to get to know each other. You need to go places and do things where you are able to communicate and talk with each other. Does that make sense? Now, if you spend time in communication with someone, will you get to know them? You can't help it. If they're trustworthy, will you come to trust them? More and more. If they're not trustworthy, what will happen? You'll trust them less and less, and you won't go anywhere with that one. So may I suggest... It's not rocket science to take this simple concept and move it right over to Jesus. If the focus of my life after I commit myself to Jesus, I understand grace enough to say, yes, I want to get on the bus. I step on that bus by faith. What is my focus from now on? It's to get to know Jesus. What is that going to take? The same thing as with anybody else. You're going to have to take some time to spend with Jesus. And that time will involve communication. May I suggest Bible and prayer? We know, or we believe, and I, I believe I know, that the Bible is God's word to us. 
I believe he also speaks through his Holy Spirit. I believe he can speak directly to our minds. But I know if I open this book, I'm communing with God. He's talking to me here. And if my focus is to get to know Jesus, and by the way, that is the focus of this Bible and prayer time, not to figure out the meaning of Daniel 7 and who the little horn is. That has its place and time, and that was last night. But the focus of this time is to get to know Jesus. Where is Jesus most clearly talked about in Scripture? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels. I suggest for this time you just read the Gospels over and over and over again. And then you may find some good books where others who have studied it a lot more than you have help you understand the story of Jesus and some of the history and some of the background. Go ahead and use some helps, but focus on the life of Jesus. Spend time with his word and then some time talking with him about your life and what you read. Not a big old prayer list, but more like a conversation over dinner. Just talk about what's on your heart. You know, prayer isn't just some formal thing where you get on your knees and, and, and talk about all your needs and how God needs to fix that, this, that, and the other thing and that person and so on. This is prayer where you're simply learning to have a conversation with God like you would over dinner with a friend. Prayer does not require a special language. Sometimes we've heard people pray and they have their voice changes, you know, and their demeanor changes and they start saying thee and thou and wouldest and shouldest and various other ancient English words as if that's how we pray. No, just talk to God. I like to say if you know how to talk, you know how to pray because you use just normal language. Talk to God as you're talking to a friend and that is what prayer is all about. Now, if you spend time in communication reading the Bible, uh, quiet and alone, with Jesus, talking to him, reading, just having this conversation. You give that, give that some time every day. Will you get to know him? He's very clear in the word that he's as close as he can get to us without invading our space. He's not, if you come to me with him, he's not going to be standoffish. He says, you knock on the door, I'll come in. Or I'm knocking on the door, you open the door, I'll come in. He's just on the other side of the door saying, can I come in? And when you open the door and give him time, he comes right in and there's communion. So I believe that the focus of the Christian life, once you commit yourself to Jesus, is not to try hard to be good and not be bad. It's to try hard to spend time with Jesus. And have you noticed that relationships require trying hard to spend time together? We'd all like to believe it's just going to be spontaneous. But if it's only spontaneous, you know the job and the kids and a few other things are going to grab that time left and right until there's none left. You have to schedule time in our busy days if you're going to keep your marriage alive. You need to have a date night. You need to have a day off that you spend time together. Not a day you spend time fixing the house and cleaning everything up. A day you spend together doing things that facilitate communion and, 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 and your romance together. And if you don't do that, it's going to fall apart. And I believe we have to schedule time with Jesus. Decide that every day we're going to take some time with Jesus. Open our Bibles, get alone, get quiet, and ask him to meet us there. Read about him, think about it, imagine the picture, put yourself in the story, and then talk to him about what you see and what you experience. I believe he will come and meet with you. And that's really the only thing you can do to make the Christian life work, is hang out with Jesus. Now, we have discussed this from a logic and illustration point with the chair and with relationships. Let's look at it from the Bible. Over in John chapter 6, you have the story of where Jesus fed 5,000 people with a sack lunch. Then he sent them home. We know from the story, by the way, all four Gospels give this story. So you put them all four together, you see all the pieces. We know that there was only one boat, and he had the disciples get it and leave, and the people went home on foot along the shore, and Jesus headed the other way up in the mountain to pray. Now the next day, the people decided they wanted to go find Jesus. So where do you think they went to look for him? Where they left him. But he wasn't there. So they went back to town, clear across the lake, and there he was. 
There he was. Now, look at John 6 and verse 25. When they found him on the other side of the sea, they said, Rabbi, when did you come here? Now, the ironic thing about this statement is when they found him on the other side of the sea, because you see, there's no way he could have gotten from one side to the other without a boat in the dark. And yet here he is. Well, they didn't know it, but that was the night he walked on water. But when they say to him, Rabbi, when did you come here? They're not asking, did you get here at 9 or 10 or 6? They're saying, how'd you do that? How'd you get from there to there without any transportation in the middle of the night when it's dark? It's too far. How'd you do it? Now look at verse 26, Jesus' response. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Which being translated means you're not looking for me because you saw the miracles, signs, that's what that word means, is the miracles that Jesus did to give evidence that he was more than just a human so they'd trust him as their Messiah and Savior. You're not looking for me because you saw the signs and want to ha commit yourself to me as the Messiah. You ate the loaves and were filled, which being translated means you just want another meal. I gave you dinner, you're back for breakfast. So Jesus says, essentially, I'm not going to tell you how or when I got here. I'm going to tell you why you're looking for me. You're a bunch of freeloaders. You just want another meal. Verse 27, he says, do not labor. What's another word for labor? Work. Do not work for the food which perishes. What's he talking about? Regular food that you eat. And the next thing you know, a few hours later, you need some more. It doesn't last, right? Don't work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you. You've got to realize most people in the world today, and these people back then, are on a subsistence level. Most of the people in our world today spend every moment of every day trying to scratch out getting enough food to eat. We are all wealthy, even if we're poor. These people spend all day, every day, just trying to survive. And now they've met this guy who can take five loaves and two fishes and feed 5,000 men plus their families. We got to hang on to this guy. We've got a bread wagon here. And they come to Jesus and say, when did you come here? And Jesus says, I'm not going to tell you, but I'm going to tell you why you're looking for me. You just want another meal. Don't put all your focus on getting enough to eat. Human beings are made for more than survival. The theory of evolution wants to tell you that you'll be happy if you get enough to eat without being eaten and leave a few offspring that have that one in a trillion chance of having a positive mutation to improve the species. And then you die. And hopefully you have a few thrills on the way. God says, no, I made you for more than that. Human beings are not satisfied with just enough to eat, a place to live, and a secure job. Human beings need meaning, and that meaning comes in their connection with God. That's why even people who don't believe in God end up making up some kind of spirituality because they're trying to fill that void. So Jesus says, don't just work on surviving. I want you to work on the eternal food that I will give you because God has set his seal. You see that part of the verse? What was the seal? They saw him feed the 5,000 with the sack lunch the day before. He healed many people of their diseases. God gave them all the evidence they needed to seal the fact that he was more than just a man. So Jesus says, you've seen the evidence. Now, will you work on spiritual food, not just physical food, eternal food that I will give you? Now, wait a minute. If you work on something, how can it be given? Work on the eternal food that I will give you. Well, if I handed you a sandwich right now, would that be a gift? Yeah, I made the sandwich. I paid for the ingredients. Here it is. Is that sandwich a gift? Is it going to do you any good just holding it in your hand? 
No, you have to work on it. How do you work on a sandwich? You eat it, right? Jesus says, I'm going to give you everything for eternal life, but you have to eat it. You need to work on eating the food that I will give you. Now, they said, Jesus said, work on something. These people were in a religion that was all based on works. The Jewish religion had so distorted the Old Testament that they turned faith into works, grace into works. It was all about doing the right thing so God would approve of you and let you into heaven. And any time you are trying to get to heaven by fulfilling a list of rules and of duties, you're never going to feel like you've done quite enough. So you're always looking for the next teacher, the next rabbi, to put that one thing on the list so you'll finally feel like you've made it. And by the way, you'll never get there. But essentially they look at Jesus and they say, what shall we do? Verse 28, to work the works of God. You told us to work on something. What shall we work on? What does God want us to work on? And you know, Jesus at this point could have said, sorry, it's not by works, it's by grace alone. You don't work on anything. But that's not what he said. What did he say? Verse 29, this is the work of God that you what? Believe, Believe or trust on him whom he has sent. What does God want you to work on according to the very words of Jesus? God wants you to work on trusting Jesus. How do you do that? Oh, by getting to know him. But notice the parable here. Jesus says work on spiritual food, eternal food. And they say, what do we work on? He says, work on trusting me. So working on trusting Jesus is working on eternal food. Working on eternal food is working on trusting Jesus. They are the same thing. He's giving a parable. Now, Drop down to verse 48. There's a lot of good stuff still in this chapter, but we're, we've got to sort of cut to the chase here. Jump down to verse 48. Jesus says, notice he says, work on eternal food, which is working on trusting Jesus. And then he says in verse 48, I am the food. I'm the bread of life. So notice, they come back for breakfast and Jesus says, I'm not going to give you breakfast. I'm going to give you myself. I'm the bread. Verse 49, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they're dead. There's a context there because after he told them to work on eternal food, they says, well, how about some manna? You know, Moses gave them manna. Could we have some manna? Could we have breakfast? If you'll feed us again, we'll trust you. He says, no, I'm the food. I'm the bread. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they're dead. Manna, angel's food, dropped from heaven for 40 years. Every morning there was manna. And all that manna did, that heavenly bread did, was feed them while they grew old and eventually died. Then Jesus says in verse 50, this is the bread, speaking of himself, which is coming down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh that I will give for the life of the world. Once I heard a preacher with my very own ears in the same room, it wasn't even online, read this passage about Jesus feeding the 5,000 and his conclusion from that was that we, as churches, should be running feeding ministries. Well, I'm all for feeding the hungry. But isn't it interesting that's exactly what Jesus didn't do in this passage. They came back for another meal and he said, no, I'll give you myself. I'm the bread. Even if I gave you manna, you just grow old and die on the manna. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. You eat this bread, you won't die, you will live forever. Jesus says, I am better than manna. Verse 52, the Jews quarreled among themselves saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Now the Jews, that phrase in the Gospel of John, doesn't mean the, the rank and file people, it means the leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the rulers. So they start picking at what Jesus is saying. It's like, come on, folks. 
this guy's weird. We don't eat pigs, much less people. Humans aren't kosher. What's he talking about? So they're trying to cast doubt on what he's saying. And in a way, you think Jesus might say, you know, this illustration isn't quite working. I should change it. No, he digs in deeper. Look at the next verse. Verse 53, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life. Believe it or not, the Bible is very clear that even of kosher meat, even of clean meats, you're not to drink the blood. You're to drain the blood and eat it without the blood. Which, by the way, makes it very tasteless. But Jesus says, you not only have to eat my flesh, you got to drink my blood. Verse 54, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I'll raise him up at the last day. You get eternal life now so that even if you die, you'll come up in the right resurrection. Amen. Verse 55, for my flesh is food indeed and my blood is drink indeed. In other words, I'm the true food and the true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. Don't jump over that too soon. Abide means you'll stay. When you get married, you want your marriage to abide. When you come to Jesus, you want to abide. How do you abide? Eat and drink Jesus. Verse 57, as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. We live if we feed on Jesus. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Jesus is emphatic that he is the spiritual food. If we eat and drink him, we will not die, verse 50. We will live forever, verse 51. We'll have eternal life, verse 54. We'll come up in the right resurrection, verse 54. We'll abide, we'll stay in Jesus. We won't fall away, verse 56. We'll live because of Jesus, and once again in verse 58, we'll live forever. Jesus uses a parable here. He says, physical food is the physical life, what spiritual food is the spiritual life. If you want to stay alive physically, you gotta eat. I have a cousin who used to say, he wasn't very tall, he, even in eighth grade, he had to sit in the front row with the girls for the eighth grade class, class picture because he hadn't grown yet. And he, he said he went home one day and he measured himself against the wall, you know, against the door frame. And then he went out and hung on the clothesline to try to help things along a little bit. Hang on there as long as he could. And then he went back in and measured himself, hadn't done any good at all. If you want to grow and become strong, do you work on growing and becoming strong? Or do you work on eating and sleeping and being healthy? Funny thing, if you eat, you're going to grow. And if you have a good diet, you'll grow better than on a bad diet. And Jesus is a really good diet. And if you eat Jesus, you'll grow spiritually, just like as if you eat food, you'll grow physically. You can't go hang on a spiritual clothesline of trying to be good and somehow gain spiritual stature any more than physical. Jesus says physical food is the physical life. What spiritual food is the spiritual life. He always taught in parables, and this is a parable. So let's just draw it out here for the fun of it. On a physical level, how often do you need to eat? Every day. We think three times a day, but if we had a good meal every day, we could keep going. Right? If you miss a day, are you dead? No. You're hungry, but you're not dead. If you miss too many days, will you die? You're awful reticent on that one. If you stop eating, will you die? Yes. My dad used to tell me a stupid joke. He only knew two jokes, and this was one of them. He'd say, Gary, did you hear about the guy who taught his horse not to eat? Of course, I'd heard it a dozen times, but I'd say, oh, no, Dad, I haven't heard that one. And he'd say, you know, funny thing, he just got that horse trained, and the horse up and died. Taught him not to eat. If you stop eating, you'll die. It's a dumb joke, but it makes a point, doesn't it? How often do you need to eat? Daily. If you miss a day, are you dead? No, you're just hungry. If you miss too many days, will you die? Yes, you'll starve to death. And can you survive on eating one meal a week? And I'm going to say no. 
Even as a couch potato, you're going to burn off more calories than you can stuff in in one sitting, which means you're going to decline until you die. Okay, physical food to physical life. Let's go to the spiritual side. If the parallel fits, and Jesus said it fits, how often do you need a spiritual meal? Daily. If you miss a day, are you dead spiritually? No, you're not earning your salvation by clocking an hour with Jesus. It's a relationship. If my wife and I are apart for a day or a week, we don't lose our marriage, but if we permanently separate, we will, right? You need a spiritual meal every day. If you miss a day, you're not dead. But if you miss too many days, can you die? Yes, I've seen a lot of people just flat lose their spiritual life. And if you only eat once a week spiritually, can you maintain your spiritual life? And I say no. Going to church once a week is not enough. You've got to learn to feed yourself daily. You've got to cook and eat at home. Church is going out to eat. You've got to learn to feed yourself. You see, looking at what Jesus says here about spiritual food, one preacher that I knew many years ago said, you know, if, if you just spend the amount of time every day that it takes to cook and eat a simple meal, if you spend that much time with Jesus, you couldn't miss heaven. You, you think about Daniel. We didn't read this story, Daniel 6. But Daniel prayed three times a day. It looks like every time he had a meal, he went for a spiritual meal too. He paralleled his physical eating with his spiritual eating. If you would spend as, as much time with Jesus every day that you do eating every day, you would be a giant of a Christian. And if you do it as diligently as you eat... I don't care how busy you are, you find time to eat. Now, that we can drive through a burrito at Taco Bell, we may get bad food that doesn't nourish us as well and puts on the pounds and whatever else happens. So fast food might have made this illustration a little bit corrupt. But if we'd spend the time with Jesus every day and as diligently every day as we spend eating, we would be strong, growing, giant Christians. That's the point Jesus is trying to make here. We need a daily spiritual meal. Now, when, if you only had one meal a day, if that was all you could get was one meal a day, when would that would be the ideal time to eat that meal? I would argue it's breakfast. I'm not a big breakfast guy. But if you could only eat one meal a day, get that tank full at the beginning of the day so you have some energy to get through the day, you can go to bed hungry and sleep. But you can't work all day if there's no energy. And we find Jesus would get up early in the morning to go spend time with his father. All the great Christians I can read stories about, they met Jesus early in the morning for their Bible and prayer time, their time with God. We need a spiritual breakfast. You know, I've discovered that the greatest battle of my life, bigger battle than overcoming any sin I've tried to overcome, is the battle to take consistent daily time alone with Jesus. Because let me tell you, when you decide you're going to do that, Satan will make all hell break out in your life. Because he knows he's going to lose you now. As long as you're just working on your sins, he can trip you up now and then and keep you. But when you start deciding, I'm going to spend time with Jesus every day to get to know him better, he knows he's cooked, and he will do everything he can to interrupt that time. And sometimes you'll go out for your spiritual breakfast, you know, and you'll, you'll be eating your spiritual breakfast, and it'll taste great. It'll, you, you're reading the Bible, and it's coming alive, and it, it's good, and you pray, and it's like God's in the room having a conversation, and you go away saying, man, this was good. The next morning, you go to do the same thing, and it tastes like God ground up the box and fed it to you. And you pray, and it's bouncing off the ceiling, and it seems like he's not even in the same universe. 
Did you ever have your mother feed you food that you didn't like but say, eat it? You need it? Sometimes the breakfast tastes great and sometimes it doesn't taste so great. But if you sit down to breakfast with Jesus, will you get the nutrients you need? He says, it's up to me. You spend the time with me, it'll happen. All right. Illustration of the chair, logic of relationship, Jesus' parable of eating. What is my focus as a Christian day by day? Is it to try hard to be good and not be bad? Or is it, to try to hard, is it to try hard to develop that relationship of trust with Jesus? That's where I put my focus. The one thing God can't do for you is seek a relationship with himself for you. Nobody can eat for you. Nobody can sleep for you. Nobody can breathe for you. Nobody can love another person for you. And that's something you can do. He gives the food. He comes. He's made it all possible. And there's one thing you can't do. You can't change your life. Even if you change the outward behavior, you can't change the heart. And Jesus said it's the heart that matters. So guess what? You can't fix your behavior clear down to the heart level. And he can. And he can't seek a relationship for you. So you see, we end up trying to do what we can't do and leave to him what he can't do. We go trying to be good, and he's saying, no, 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 that's my job. You work on knowing me. That's the one thing you can do, and changing your life is the one thing I can do. So if we will work on knowing him, he says, I got you covered. I'll get you there. I'll have you ready when you get there. You got to just trust me with that. You spend time seeking to trust me. Now, let's wrap it up then with this. What is the focus of the Christian life once you give your life to Jesus? It's to day by day seek your spiritual meal to get to know him, which is working on trust by seeking to know him day by day. All right, we're going to wrap up with three verses. John 1, 12. As many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe on his name. Did you receive Jesus? Were you here the other night? We prayed that prayer? Okay, we did it. Good. Uh, have you believed in his name? You said, yes, Lord, I, I'm choosing to trust you. Did you get on the bus? Yes. Then it says you have become a child of God. How secure is a child in a family? The way a family is supposed to be. Totally secure, right? Are you still part of the family even when you're naughty? Yes. Parents may pick you up, dust you off, bind your wounds, dry your tears, and discipline you if you need it, but you're still part of the family. Now, here's a point. I told you the focus of the chair, chair illustration was one thing, that the focus of the Christian life is not on behavior, it's on trust. Now here's where the chair illustration doesn't work. Every time you goof doesn't mean you've lost your salvation. It can sound like whenever you get out of this chair, you make a mistake, you've gotten out of the chair, you're out of Christ, you're no longer saved. No, 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 no. Now you have to switch to the family metaphor of this verse. When you're in a family, you're still in the family even when you're naughty. Does that make sense? How secure is the family? John 6, 37, all the Father gives to me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will by no means cast out. Will God ever throw you out of the family? No. Is it possible for you to sin long enough and hard enough for God to throw you out of the family? No. It's the strongest negative in the Greek language right there in that verse. Absolutely no way, uh-uh, never, never will he throw you out. But you know what? There are two ways out of the family. Number one, he doesn't chain you in the closet. The door is open. You can leave. But nobody walks out of a family in which they have good relationships. Isn't that right? But there's one more way out of the family. You get so busy up in your room, maybe trying to get an education or looking at entertainment or whatever you're doing up there, trying to clean up your act, that you never come down for dinner. What's eventually going to happen? You're going to starve to death in your room. And they'll have to carry you out and bury you with great sadness. But if you simply come down to dinner and dine daily with dad, you'll never leave and you'll never die. You see, it all comes down to 
dining daily with Jesus. And he says, I'll never throw you out, and you'll never leave, and you're secure. Final verse. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. I love that. Jesus says, I show up every morning with breakfast. I got the menu. I got the food. Do you have the time? He knocks on the door. I'm too busy today, Lord. I got up too late. I watched the Late Late Show. I didn't get enough sleep. You know, I had to sleep in. Okay. But every day he knocks on your door and he says, if you've got the time, I've got the food. And if we'll just open the door and say, come, and he says, we will dine together. We'll have a dinner date, a breakfast date together. As a Christian, you have to decide you're going to Center your life around your time with Jesus. No longer do you center your life around your spouse, your friends, your career, your kids. The number one center of your life is around your time with Jesus, and then everything else falls into place. If you eat, you'll live. If you don't, you'll starve. Jesus is the food, you and him together having breakfast daily. Church is important, but only after time with Jesus. Everything else comes after time with Jesus. Eat and you will live. Eat Jesus and you'll live forever. Jesus, thank you for showing, every day, showing up every day with the food Thank you for giving us your undivided time every day. Forgive us for being so busy and not prioritizing time with you. Lord, starting tomorrow morning, may each of us plan some time to open that door, let you in, and have our spiritual meal so that we can grow to be strong and mighty and Christ-like people in you, we pray. Amen.